sat down there that I picked up the wrong imitation black leather Bible, uh, and it is a different version, so I'm going to borrow the Pew Bible. And I know that it says in there that we're going to be reading Revelation 21 and 22, and some of you saw that and said, well, I better head out now. <laughs> we're going to begin with just the first five verses of Revelation 21. So as you are turning uh, in your copy of Scripture uh, to Revelation 21, uh, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to, to Chris for inviting me. Thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, it's a joy and a privilege and an honor to be here with you. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. This is the word of God for the people of God. Most five-year-olds spend their afternoons playing cops and robbers or pretending to be their favorite superhero. I wasn't most five-year-olds. My best friend and I played church. Jason led the singing. He would, of course, announce the hymn number and then he'd motion over to the piano, where on a typical Sunday morning, his grandmother, Joyce, the accompanist, would sit. So he'd announce the hymn number, and then he'd say, Hit it, Joyce! <laughs> After we sang a, a few songs, a few hymns, I made my way to the pretend pulpit there in my parents' living room. I preached the sermon, and as a, as a good Baptist, I, of course, offered an invitation at the end. Jason and I would then take turns baptizing each other into a blue blanket-covered couch. After a couple of good Duncans each, I would turn and quote Pastor Don, who was quoting the Gospel of Luke, saying, Lord, we've done as you've commanded us, and still there is room. There was one hymn that was a staple during our living room church services. It's still one of my favorites. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Over the past month, we've waited through Advent. The Advent season, we've waited with hopeful anticipation, and just a few days ago, our waiting came to an end as we celebrated the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. You know, it was at that first Christmas that God flipped the page and began a new chapter in God's epic story of redemptive love. It was at Christmas that, that God became flesh and dwelt among us. And it is at Christmas where God's story leaps from its pages and into our lives. It's at Christmas where, where we are reminded that God's incarnation was not a once and done event but that God is still choosing to dwell among us. 
and even in and through us. It's at Christmas where our stories intersect with God's story in a real tangible way. It's at Christmas where our stories find new life in connection with the birth of our Savior. Because like the old hymn of the faith, we have blessed assurance because we have been born of God's Spirit. This is my story, and and it's your story. This is our story. It's God's story. We are God's beloved, and we live and tell God's story through our own lives and stories. I need to pause here for just a moment. I realize the possible risk of making a confession especially the first time meeting you and standing before you. Yet I also understand the benefit of full disclosure and honesty and vulnerability. So here it goes. I confess that I have preached a sermon titled To Be Continued Before, and it was from the last two chapters of Revelation. Okay, that wasn't too bad, and confession's good for the soul. Nobody's left yet, so we are okay. Let me clarify this confession. I did indeed preach a sermon using the same title and text, but I only got to preach the 8.30 service and wasn't able to continue for the 11 o'clock service. And also for further clarification, I'm not preaching the exact same sermon from January 3rd, 2016. I'm sure you're all waiting with bated breath to know why I didn't preach both services and why I'm reusing a sermon title and preaching from the same text. January 3rd, 2016 started as a pretty normal Sunday morning. I woke up, ate a small breakfast, showered, put on a suit and a bow tie. The first Sunday of the year is a pretty typical day for an associate minister to be asked to preach. And so on January 3rd, 2016, I was called out of the bullpen. I kissed Mary Kate goodbye and told her that I would call to check on her after the 8.30 service before Sunday school. She hadn't felt well all weekend. I began my sermon by reading the New Testament lesson from Revelation 21 and 22. I intended to remind the congregation that as we celebrate a new year, that we are to realize that we are called to the work of helping make all things new. I must admit, however, that I don't remember how well my intended message communicated to the congregation. Because as I sat down during the offertory... After preaching, my phone buzzed in my pocket. On a typical Sunday morning, I wouldn't dare check my phone in the middle of a worship service, and I certainly wouldn't do it right before getting ready to serve at the Lord's table. But I knew that Mary Kate was at home, and she had not felt well all weekend. And oh yeah, she was 34 weeks pregnant with our twin daughters. I snuck my phone out of my pocket and I quickly read the text. We may need to go to the hospital when you get home. I'm in a lot of pain and I cannot get comfortable no matter what. I don't know what to do. I'm never one to try to expedite the Lord's Supper. You know, it's one of the most sacred things we do. And I hope that I was still able to reverently present the bread and the cup, the body and the blood to celebrate the holy meal But if I'm being honest, the rest of the service was a blur. After we sang, blessed be the tie that binds with all that were gathered, I broke those binds and I ran down the hallway. A few others quickly followed and through fumbled words, I tried to explain what was going on. Two youth Sunday school teachers said, we'll take care of Sunday school, you go ahead. The missions minister said, William, give me your sermon, I'll go make a copy in case you can't get back, I'll preach it for you. This is a much longer story, but I realize that we probably want to beat the Methodists to lunch. So uh, I'm going to tell you the condensed version. I finally made it home, checked on Mary Kate. At the direction of Mary Kate's on-call nurse, uh, we loaded up and headed to the hospital. They sent us to one hospital. Labor and delivery was packed. We headed across town to the other hospital. 1045, we walk in to labor and delivery at St. Francis Hospital in Richmond, Virginia. We thought this was just a... 
high-risk checkup to make sure that everything was okay and that, that there wasn't something seriously wrong. Boy, were we wrong. It got very serious very quickly. The on-call doctor discovered that Mary Kate had developed preeclampsia and her blood pressure was through the roof. Mary Kate was a champ through it all. I was uh, an emotional wreck. Let me remind you that we arrived to the hospital at 10.45 a.m. At 11.28 and 11.29, we had babies. Adeline Charlotte and Dorothy Hope arrived a little early than where they were scheduled. But they were perfect. I stood between their isolates the day after they were born with my then pastor, and I looked at him and I said, Jeff, I've believed in God my whole life, but never more than I do right now. You see, January 3rd, 2016 started as a pretty normal Sunday. But before my sermon about God doing new things was preached by another minister at the 11 o'clock service, God was already busy doing new things in our life together. Our lives were changed in a new chapter and God's great, big, epic story was being penned by the masterful author. January 3rd, 2016 started as a pretty normal Sunday morning, but then something extraordinary happened. Dorothy Hope and Adeline Charlotte were born. But more than the names that we gave them, God had already given them a name, and that was Beloved. January 3rd, 2016 was the day that Dorothy and Adeline became a part of God's To Be Continued. Most people hate spoilers. Just ask any Star Wars fan. There's a cult-like following of Star Wars. Just ask my brother. My brother's one of the obsessed. He went to the Star Wars convention in Orlando a couple of years ago. And he and his wife just last Thursday got preview tickets on Thursday night to see the latest Star Wars movie knowing that their baby boy would be born 12 hours later. She was a trooper to support him. If you want to really anger a Star Wars fan, tell them the ending before they've seen it. I must admit that I've only seen half of one of the most recently released Star Wars movies, so I won't be sharing any spoilers if you haven't had a chance to see the latest movie. But you know there are other times when we want to know what happens next. We want a spoiler. We wait anxiously for the results of a medical test or diagnosis. We hope and pray that we pass our final exam or that our teacher thinks our paper is worthy of an A. We look forward to the championship and we want to know if we're going to be celebrating or bandaging our fanatical wounds. Unfortunately, the latter is true for me and my beloved Crimson Tide. In my own life, I don't, I don't want to see every detail but I wouldn't mind being able to see the trailer to at least get a glimpse of what's going, to, what's going to happen and to see that everything is going to be okay. And, you know, maybe that's what those early Christ followers were hoping for when they picked up the latest edition of the Patmos Post to read the editorial and horoscope penned by John the Revelator as he sat in prison on a lonely island. Maybe they wanted to know the end of the story. Maybe they wanted to know what eternity would look like. Maybe they wanted a spoiler that would tell them that everything turns out okay. In the final two chapters of Revelation, John lays it all out there based on a vision that he had, that God had given him. John writes that forever will be more than okay. Forever will be literally heavenly. I guess, since I'm preaching a sermon with the same title, I should read the scripture in the same way I did on January 3rd, 2016. So, from the Jesus Storybook Bible, I see a throne, and on the throne is a king, and the king is Jesus. All around the throne, people are bowing down. 
They are giving him their treasures. There are loud cheers and clapping, clapping and bright laughter, like thousands, like a thousand waterfalls, and everyone bursts out singing a new song. This is our king, the lamb who died so that we don't have to. Our rescuer, all honor and glory forever and ever. And every creature everywhere in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea joins in. And then from all around a wide, immense, beautiful silence. And I see Satan, God's horrible enemy, thrown down, defeated. I see a sparkling city shimmering in the sky, glittering, glowing, coming down from heaven and from the sky. Heaven is coming down to earth. God's city is beautiful. Walls of topaz, jasper, sapphire. Wide streets paved with gold. Glimmering pearl gates that are never locked shut. Where is the sun? Where is the moon? They aren't needed anymore. God is all the light people need. No more darkness, no more night. And the king says, look, God and his children are together again. No more running away or hiding. No more crying or being afraid or lonely. No more being sick or dying. Because all those things are gone. Yes, they're gone forever. Everything sad has come untrue. And see, I have wiped away every tear from every eye. And then a deep, beautiful voice that sounded like thunder in the sky says, Look, I am making everything new. It was hard to squeeze all John saw into words and fit it onto a page, and cram it into a book, all the words on all the pages of all the books in all the world would never be enough. I'm the beginning, Jesus said, and the ending. One day, John knew heaven would come down and mend God's broken world and make it our true perfect home once again. And he knew in some mysterious way that would be hard to explain, that everything was going to be more wonderful for once having been so sad. And he knew then that the ending of the story was going to be so great. It would make all the sadness and tears and everything seem like just a shadow that is chased away by the morning sun. I'm on my way, said Jesus. I'll be there soon. John came to the end of his book. But he didn't write the end, because, of course, that's how stories finish. And this one's not over yet. So instead, he wrote, come quickly, Jesus, which perhaps is really just another way of saying, to be continued. The greatest story ever told begins at the beautiful and perfect creation. God took the the chaos of nothingness and created all that there is and made it good. And then the, the story tells of God's people as they become lost and yet found over and over and over again. This epic story tells of God who is creator and rescuer and life giver and sustainer and comforter and healer and prayer answerer and protector and guide, nurturer and friend, Emmanuel. Many people thought God's story was over after years of waiting, that God wouldn't actually show up. And yet, the greatest story ever told blossomed at Christmas with the birth of the Christ child, God with us. God's story is quite the epic. The Star Wars saga doesn't even hold a candle to God's epic story. God's people had begged for a long time for a new hope. And God delivered on the request by sending Jesus, the Messiah, God's tangible and real presence that brings new life and new hope to a world 
that has taken God's goodness and returned it to chaos. There was a deep thirst for for righteousness and mercy and love in a deeply broken world. God's epic story took an even more dramatic turn. At the end of Jesus' life on earth, the Roman Empire strikes back and Jesus was put to death. Many people thought that this was the end of God's epic story still, and yet, that was all a part of the script. Jesus wouldn't remain dead, and as for God's epic story, it still was not the end. Jesus took the sin and shame of the world and put it all to death. There on that cross as he was crucified, and then three days later, he was resurrected, and we were resurrected too. And there we see more of God's epic story unfold in the return of the, I'm not going to say Jedi, the Son of God. God's epic story did not end there. John's revelation tells of his great vision of a new heaven and a new earth, a new home where God's neighbors will be God's own children. There will be no more crying, no more wars, no more pain. No more death. The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the ending, the source of all things, our mighty and loving and merciful God will give water, the water of life to all who thirst. The great creator promises that yet again, I am making all things new. There will be no more temple because everything and everywhere will be God's dwelling God's holy sanctuary. Emmanuel, God with us, will put down roots again and live with us. John then envisions a river of life and a tree that will satisfy every hunger and every thirst and every need. There will be no more need for street lights or night lights. No more need for the sun or the moon because God will be the only light that we need. It will illuminate the entire earth. And as I just read, John's vision comes to an end with Jesus saying, I'm coming soon. John's revelation ends, but God's epic story does not end there. It's still being written right now. So here we are on the Sunday after Christmas. It's still a part of the Christmas season, the last Sunday of 2019. Sadly, the world is still full of chaos and evil and brokenness. And yet, the world is still full of God's redeeming love and God's merciful presence. John's revelation reminds us that God's epic story has not reached the end. Every time we pray, come Lord Jesus, heal this land, heal my life, heal her, heal them we should be reminded that God is always doing something new. God is making all things new. God's epic story is still being written and told through you and through me. It's through us, God's beloved children, that the force awakens. This God force of redemptive love and grace awakens yet again and again and again as God's epic story is lived out in and through each of us. Just a few days ago, we celebrated Jesus becoming God incarnate. But we are reminded, too, that we are cast in God's epic story. And we, too, have been given a grace-filled opportunity known as our lives to incarnate God's redemptive love to this world. God's incarnation wasn't a once-and-done event. It's still happening. This is our story. This is our song. God's epic story is our story and our song. And we must tell it and sing it. For a world anxiously in need of a hope-filled spoiler. The world deeply needs the life-giving water of the river of life. And we are streams and springs and fountains and geysers of God's living water. Helping to quench the thirsts of this world. We are a part of God's tree of life for which the world hungers. We bear the fruit of Jesus' love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
We are the branches and the leaves that give shade and offer rest and breathe new life into the world. We are the roots that help give foundation to the turbulence going on around us. Jesus came as the light of the world, a light so bright that darkness could not, cannot, and will not overcome it. And it is this Jesus light that shines through each of us that illuminates a dark world, sometimes as a candle providing peace in the darkest night, sometimes a spotlight illuminating the need of another and how we can help, sometimes a lighthouse beckoning the wayward wanderer to come home. The world desperately hungers and thirsts for the day when God and his children are together again. No more running away or hiding, no more crying or being lonely or afraid, no more being sick or dying because all things, all of those things are gone. And see, I have wiped away every tear from every eye and then we will hear this deep, beautiful voice that sounds like thunder saying, look, I am making all things new. There are times in our lives when we wish Jesus would hurry up and come quickly. And yet Jesus needs us to go quickly. If we listen closely to our beckoning to heaven that says, Come, Lord Jesus, we might, in fact, hear a beckoning from heaven that says, Go, be Jesus. God's epic story is not finished. We are a part of God's to be continued. When we tell our stories as God's beloved children, we tell God's epic story. When we allow God to tell our stories, to write our stories, we become echoes of mercy and whispers of love. This is our story. This is our song. Here we are, the last Sunday of 2019, and in just a few days we will enter a new year, a new decade. What story is your life telling? Or better yet, whose story are you telling? How is Jesus working in and through you today? How will you help quench the thirsts of the world? How will you be the life-giving presence of Jesus? How will you provide light in the darkest places? How will you become the pages of the story on which God will pin the next chapter of God's epic story? I'm on my way, said Jesus. I'll be there soon. But John didn't write the end because that's, of course, how stories end. So instead, he wrote, come quickly, Jesus, which perhaps is really just another way of saying to be continued. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving and merciful God, our creator who created each of us with unique precision and called us your beloved. May we live as such. As we celebrated just a few days ago, you becoming incarnate in this world through Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, may we be reminded that we are called to carry your presence, your incarnated presence with us wherever we go. Write the rest of our stories so that the world might be filled with hope. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.